Morning, church. Morning, YouTube, as always. Wonderful and a privilege and an honor to handle the word of God. You know, that's what we're called to do. That's what a man of God is called to do, to handle the word of God properly, to handle it as it's told to be taught, to handle it with the truth and what it all stands for. That is what a man of God that preaches the word is called to do. Anything else is no good. But today we're going to be really getting into it. We're going to talk about a really cool message and something that the Lord has showed me. What is it to be afraid? Let's find feel, feeling of fear and anxiety, frightened. So many live in a world of fear, not knowing what our country is going. No one does, but the Lord, not knowing what this erratic weather is going to bring. You know, we're getting hit with Hurricane Hillary on the West Coast. That don't happen. Not to know what kind of diseases I'm told that we have another strand of COVID coming in October that's going to be different, you know, this is going to be happening every year, just so you know. And, but a lot of people have fear of all these things. And the biggest fear, which we know, is the fear of dying. The rise of anti-anxiety drugs, I did research on this, has risen. The number one age for anti-anxiety drugs is between 44 and 65. That is the biggest increase in the use. It's rapidly climbing. But today we want to discuss the powerful words that Jesus has used in will to a Pharisee leader named Jairus. So if you have your word, we're going to go to Mark. 522 to 33 and I just want to forewarn you there's a lot going on here so play pay real close attention if you can mark 522 starts and says behold there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue Jairus by name and when we saw him he fell at his feet and he besought him greatly saying my little daughter lieth at the point of death I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she may li and she live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all she had and had nothing better but rather grew worse. And when she heard of Jesus, came in to press behind and touched his garment. Now listen to this. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto them, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what she had what done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. That's so wonderful, the scripture. But there's a lot happening because this is the significance. Prior to him to Jairus coming to him and asking him to come to his house and touch and lay hands upon his daughter, he just healed a man with a legion of demons inside of him. He lived in the tombs and he would cry out at night and there'd be blood on his face and he would cut himself. You know, people still cut themselves because they're in pain. So what do they do? They cut themselves. This man was cutting himself because he was in pain and horror because the legion of demons were running in his life. But Jesus, he sees Jesus and knows that he is the true son of God. And Jesus graciously and mercifully, merciful heals him. But while traveling from healing man, he, he encounters Jarius. Now, this is the most important thing we have to understand. Not the most important, but part of it. Jarius is a Pharisee. The same leaders that are trying to get rid of Jesus because they think Jesus is starting a revolution. It's a cult, whatever it may be. It goes against what their, what their, their scripture, their, so they think, and their laws and their traditions. It goes against all that. And when he claims to be Jesus and God, they're done with them, okay? 
They're like, how dare him? But so the problem is he, Jarius, has to realize I am stepping out of something I don't know. I am stepping out of what I've been taught in practice. But he thinks about his daughter and he don't care. And he knows that he heard about Jesus who is the healer of nations. So he reaches out to the one that he feels has the authority and power and ability to heal his daughter. But on the way to heal his young daughter, a woman of desperation, desperation, has been dealing with the flow of blood for 12 years. Think about that. She is virtually at the end of her rope and knows in her heart that if she could get near to Jesus, she could be healed. It's called faith. She says, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, which was the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. But my friends, listen to this. The woman tried everything. She went to every doctor imaginable. She went to the, the false doctors that, that they, they sell. We used to hear years ago, snake oil salesmen. They promise you this by taking this. That's how morphine and codeine started out many years ago. Snake oil salesman. But she also reaches out to a false healer. You, you know them. They, they promise you to heal you. So she out of desperation says, he promises I will heal you. I will stop the flow. Once the money flow starts. You hear where I'm going with this? Many people use the goodness and grace and love of what God provides to make a profit. You see it on TV, you see people that promise you this handkerchief is anointed, but before you get the anointing, send me a hundred dollars. All I'm here to tell them and to tell you all, they one day will all stand in judgment. All right, this poor woman, she's broke. She's down and out, she's depressed. And figures, what do I got to lose? I've heard of him healing lepers. I've heard of him making hands restored to whole. I heard of him bringing sight to the blind. I heard of him casting demons. What do I got to lose? I'm desperate. I'm done. There's nothing else I can do. I tried everyone. And she does. Her faith healed her. Her desire to touch the hem of the Savior's garment healed her. My goodness, so listen to this. I want to read it because I have to do it justice. Her faith was bold. Her faith was true. Her faith was beautiful. She took the leap of faith and for her belief, she was healed. Many claim they know the Lord, but many do not have faith like this woman that went and touched the hem of his garment. But let's go back to what's all going on with this Pharisee and his daughter. Mark 5, 35 to 40 reads. And when he spake, there came the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troubleth the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, said Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the, the tumult and them wept and wailed greatly. And when he had come in, he said unto them, why wake ye the, the, the adolescents and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he put them out, he taketh the father and the mother and the damsel and them and where they were with him and entered into where the damsel was lying. So listen to this. Jesus just healed a woman that grabbed his garment. Then the daughter of Jairus is dead. It puts everything for Jairus and 
his family into a different perspective. The leaders that he promised, the leaders that he worshiped in the temple with, they prayed for his daughter, Jairus, who was a Pharisee, which was a, was a high up religious man, prayed for his daughter, yet no healing came. Then goes the norm. He goes beyond the norm. He goes beyond what his religion tells him should make her whole. He did all the traditions, all the purifications, everything that they thought needed to be done. And he reaches out to Jesus, just like the woman with, with the bleeding reaches out to Jesus. One of the men from the leader's house tells Jairus, don't waste his time anymore. Your little girl has passed. Think about for a moment. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. He's rushing to get Jesus to heal her. But before he gets to the house, she dies. He has nothing but anticipation. He's going and he's going as fast as he can because his daughter could die any moment. So he's going fast. What happens? A crowd comes. What happens? A woman runs up and grabs his garment. So now he's thinking, what's going on here? First, he gets the horror that he hears the news that no parent wants to hear. Your child is dead. The horror, the heartache, the heartbreak. He don't know how to handle it. Then it turns to anger. Why did it turn to anger? I'm here to tell you why. Because he's thinking, if that crowd didn't come around her, Jesus would have got to her. And my daughter would not be lying dead. Then he might even think, perhaps the woman that touched the hem used my daughter's healing. Think about that for a second. This is all going through because this is, he was human. Same things that go through your heads when things go through. You think, why? Why did this happen? But then Jesus tells him these powerful words. Be not afraid, only believe. Now listen to this. Back to the scripture. And he took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kami, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. You hear that? You hear that? So when I read this chapter, when I read that and what... Jesus told this Pharisee, I knew that we all needed to learn and draw to this more because it's such a powerful, five words is so powerful. So we asked the question, why Jesus told him first, be not afraid, be not afraid. Your daughter's not going to lie in, in death. I have the authority and the power to raise her back to life. There was a purpose for this. If, if she was dead or alive yet, and he went and healed her, they would just put him in the thing of, oh, he's a special doctor. Oh, he has healing touch, but he is not the savior. He is not God in man form. They would miss all that. Just like with Lazarus. Why was Lazarus died and resurrected? Because it wanted to increase and show and make man and his disciples and those in presence to increase their faith. If you see someone that's dead for three days and, and comes back to life, if that don't increase your faith, guess what? You, nothing ever will. But anyway, be not afraid, he says. If your religious friends that you hang around and you try to please and you try to say, you know what, this is the way we walk and they act differently, because they're not serving the way they're called to serve. But they will say to you, was that you mingling with that man called Jesus? The daughter dying had a purpose. And the purpose was to show Jarius, the three disciples he took, and everyone else of who he truly is and what his authority is. Listen to this. This blows my mind. Did you know that 
when you had, when in the Jewish custom, when someone was dying, you, you brought people, this blows my mind, to mourn for the child and play instruments and sing. Wow, that just, I, I don't understand that. I have to pay for people to mourn for the loss of my child? I don't think so. I can do it on my own. The little girl lying dead on the bed, the, the friends and family are to prepare a funeral, yet Jesus has a bigger and a better plan. Be not afraid, only believe. He tells the father, be not afraid, believe. My thoughts were that Jairus did believe from that. He had enough belief, listen to this. He had enough belief to know to step out of his religious sect, which was a no-no, to step out of his religious sect and say, you know what? I don't care what they say. I don't care if I'm excommunicated from my, my church. I'm going because I want my daughter to live. She means more to me than my religion. She means more to me than those around me because I love her and she came from me and my wife. It's beautiful. Not sure what happened to him, it doesn't tell you. But I'm here to tell you, I'm pretty sure he became a disciple. Wouldn't you, if your child lay dead and he gave that child life and every time you would see that child, it would remind you of what Jesus Christ did. Be not afraid, only believe. How many times in our lives we need to hear these words? Be not afraid, only believe. Too many times, many women, listen to this, live in a fear-stricken state, not sure what the next day will bring. Perhaps they lose a loved one and soon realize, this is why <sighs> funerals or wakes, whatever you call them, celebration life are so important because many times in that grief stricken state, people finally get it that life will not be forever. And they look and say, you know what? Wow, I'm not sure what's gonna happen to me. And then they open your heart to the gospel. So beautiful. As we all should know this, uh, listen to this. Perhaps the loved one, they lose a loved one and in a moment they realize in a blink of an eye, life is over. As we should know, just because we trust Jesus Christ, and this is where a lot of people preach the wrong thing. They think once you give your life to Jesus Christ, everything's good. It will be because you have Christ, but he, you are not promised. If we didn't go, and I tell you this all the time, if we didn't go through trials and tribulations, one would never rely on faith. One would never grow. One would never strive to be more like Christ because everything would be good. There'd be no purpose in coming out here on whether it's Sunday, whether it's Tuesday, whether it's Thursday, whatever it is. There'd be no purpose of reading your Bible because it's all good. And that's what happens to many people. Everything's good. And they miss out on what Christ has. The significant difference between a saved man, he knows where to turn for comfort. I do. I pray you do. For strength and hope when hardships hit. But the unsafe man, he can turn to family and they're going to tell them bad advice. Trust me, family don't give you good advice most of the time. You can turn to friends. They're going to say, oh, it's okay, whatever. But they are not going to be comforted as the man or woman that knows Christ will be comforted. It breaks my heart because I think about the horrifying terror for the man or woman that is going through a life ending situation. You know, they're, they're in a brink, brink of dying and they don't know the Lord. Think about that for a minute. The horror and terror breaks my heart. That's why I preach the gospel. So no one should have to go through that, but many don't want to hear. Back to Psalm 91. I'm sorry, to Psalm 91. Psalm 91, 91, one to nine. I'm sorry, it's one, one and two. I have one to nine. He that dwelleth in a secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And here's where it is. This is why I cut it down to two verses. The second verse is important. Use this one when you struggle, when you're dealing with a, a, a family situation or you're dealing with a health situation, you're dealing with a, a, a material situation, whatever it may be. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. 
In him will I trust. Be not afraid, only believe. Too many people struggle in a fear-filled life. And the main reason is they have no security of their future. I'm not talking about financial security. Does anyone, can anyone guarantee financial security? No. Tomorrow you can wake up and you can have all your money invested in Tesla or whatever you have it invested in. And it could go belly up. It could go done. You know, you could find out that someone was scamming, you know, the CEO was stealing all along and making the, the stock look better than it is, so on and so forth. We could be promised that, oh yeah, you're gonna have enough money to retire when you're 65. And then you get there and the government spent it on everything but saving for your retirement. But we can gain comfort from medication. We can gain comfort from kind words or family. A lot of people they face, but those fears will come again. Now here's, here's the key, I put a parallel to it. It is no different than the man that comes and has to be intoxicated, drugs, alcohol, whatever it would be. And he thinks, man, I feel good. Man, I had, you know, I had 12 shots or 10 beers, whatever I had. Well, I feel good. I have no worry. I have no fear. But what happens? The next morning he wakes up and all those fears reappear. And even worse, because now he's fighting a hangover. They will not help you. Be not afraid, only believe. What do you cling to when you're afraid? Who do you call out and rely upon? Not sure about you. But when I get hit on all sides, and don't trust me as a pastor, you may think, oh, he is so good. No, I don't. I get hit with a lot of different things. I must call out. I must fall down because that's my best way is to fall down and pray. The best way to pray is to be upon your knees. I fall down and pray, and I lean upon my Lord. Do you lean upon your Lord? I pray you do. Many, many are like Jarius. Maybe they know of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. Not sure why people, this is what, again, what God calls me to preach and teach and share with people. I don't know why people play the God waiting game. Eh, Pastor, I'm only 25, I'm gonna wait. Pastor, I'm only 35, I'm gonna wait. Pastor, I'm only 55, I still got plenty of years. Pastor, I'm 75, eh, it's the new 55. Guess what? We're not promised tomorrow, but people wait and then it's too late. To live a life that leads them to spend time with your Savior in word and prayer and fellowship with, with brothers and sisters in Christ that they love. Why should it take a, a very difficult event for many to even think about coming and trusting upon Christ? You know, I don't, I can't answer that. But again, I look at it, if it happens and they give their life to Christ, well, praise God. If it took, uh, you know, a cancer scare, or if it took a heart attack, or if it took losing their mom, whatever it may be, and it took them to realize, I need to look at my own life, then praise God for that. Look within your own life. This, I talk to myself. Be not afraid, only believe. Too many times we claim to believe, but when something hits, we are no different than the unsaved man. We get afraid and we fail to turn to the only one that can help. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is important to understand. This puts to bed all good people go to heaven. Maybe dogs, but not good people, okay? Neither does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, a twinkle of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be rise incorruptible. And we shall be changed for, an incorrupt, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall be, have put on immortality, then we shall be brought to pass. The saying is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory 
victory, victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not vain in the Lord, be not afraid only believe. You're going to hear that through the whole message because I want you to leave here and say, be not afraid, only believe. I want it to be ingrained in here. Some of our heads are a little thicker than others. Sometimes it takes to hear it 30 times for it to register to get through that hard wall. It happens. I'm there. Trust me. Be not afraid, only believe. The word just told us nothing can steal our victory. Nothing. Nothing can stop our lives, not even after death because we, the believer, will be united with Jesus Christ. The problem with so many is they are surface believers. They want to be done or be recognized as the Christian. They wear the Christian tag. They wear the cross to say, look at me, I'm special. I am, I am touched. No, it just means you're wearing a cross. But the thing is, it comes down to what we really understand who Jesus Christ is and where we go and where we turn when everything comes to abrupt end or where we go and we turn when life hits, when it hits the fan, so to speak. And we're like, what do I do now? Been there. If I didn't turn to the Lord, I probably wouldn't be here today to tell you about it. Okay. We know the promises never to leave nor forsake us. And that's for most everyone in our lives. Well, at some point, I don't care who they are. Your family will forsake you. There's going to come a time, you know what? I really don't want to bother with her anymore. She just gets on my last nerve. Or I don't want to bother him because, you know, he's one of those Christian wacko Jesus freaks. Well, welcome. Praise God. But death is the end result of life. You know that? I don't care what you do. You're still going to end up the same way as everyone else. Only a man that knows and trusts Jesus can obtain victory over death. Dig down deep today. Do you fear death or do you know that Jesus Christ has given you victory over it? It's a question you need to leave here today. If you can't, if you're not sure, if you're, you're a little confused by it, you watch it. If you're not sure, it's a needed question. You've got to go on your knees and pray about and say, Lord, give me the faith to believe. Change me. If there's something in my heart that's pulling me from you, let me repent from it. Be not afraid and only believe. Proverbs 3, 2 to 7. Be not afraid and only believe. Proverbs 3, 2 to 7 reads. For the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Here it is. And I, I share this all the time with you. Charles Stanley's favorite scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy way. It doesn't say the ones you choose. It doesn't say, you know what? Those that kind of want to keep to myself, it says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not afraid and only believe. Sometimes, just like Jairus, people are afraid to come and call upon Jesus. Do you understand that? What does it mean to trust someone? It means we, we put, listen to this, this is significant. We put our faith, we put our all into that person. You can do it with your president, God bless you. You can do it with your country. God bless you again. You can do it with your doctor. Lots of luck with Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it is. But I chose to do it with Jesus Christ. But who do you put your trust in? I'm going to give you some people you do. We trust when we fly in an airplane. You trust when you ride an Uber. When you go to the doctor, you pray and you trust that when they do the surgery or they give you medication, it's for the right reason. You even may trust your preacher, but planes crash. Uber can steal from you. Doctors over prescribe medications and a preacher and a pastor is but a man. Trust in the Lord. What does that mean? We depend totally upon him and we always will be the best way for our lives and certainly unto death. We trust him by confessing and believing upon him. And not just words, but it's hearts, it's our actions, and it turns into be the call of our life. 
We can lean on him. Not, not fallen because he's holding us up. He holds me up so many times. We are not dependent on our own instincts. Man depends on your own instincts, your own abilities, your own strength. And guess what? They'll get you so far. But they're certainly not going to give you salvation. But we acknowledge him. He is our conqueror of all things, especially our fears. Be not afraid, only believe. Now here it is. God put this on my heart. I know some people that watch probably will not be at. You know what? I preach because God puts it on my heart. I'm, I'm approved. I want to be approved by God, not man. Many struggle to come out of a church that fails to preach and teach the gospel for fear that others will think or treat them differently. They are chariots in churches. They, they want to be treated because they love what they get. But it takes something sometimes of significance that it did for him in order for them to realize it's but just a church of religion. It's not a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Jairus was in the same boat. He was a leader in a Jewish religion. He knew it would cost him plenty. You, I don't think we understand the significance of this. I do finally. It took a while. But he loved his daughter more than them. Many people live in fear of what others will think. Do you live in fear of what others think about you? That's a bad place to be. I used to. Then I'm like, don't care. All I care is what Jesus thinks about me. Many people live in fear of what others think. And what will happen is all the believing upon Jesus. The words I'm going to give you is, be not afraid, only believe. What Christ can do for the man or woman that trusts upon him and walks from sin and lives a righteous life is unimaginable. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I would never go back to my former self. My former self was a scumbag. Okay, I'm here to tell you. I was no good. I hate to tell you, nor were you until you gave your life to Christ. Matthew 10, 28 says, listen to this. This is so important. And I don't understand how people, but here's why people don't understand the truth because they never opened a book to read it. Amen. Matthew 10, 28 reads, and fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. What value do you place on your soul? What value? Some people think, I'm going to live in sin all my life. I enjoy it. I enjoy the, the partying and the rousing and, you know, running around with all these different, if you're a guy, women, if you're a woman with guys and, and just living it up and spending money like no tomorrow. Well, yeah, chances are there will be no tomorrow. And, you know, you're just doing everything for yourself. That's where most of us were at one time. But what is the value worth life full of sin? Here's the key. The cost of confessing and believing and following Jesus is one that I will never look back upon. Yes, it may have cost me some family members. Yes, it may have cost me some friends. But here's what I'm going to tell you right now. And I pray that you use this. If you come into Jesus Christ and loving him and putting him above everything else, your past, your sin and all that wickedness. And they don't love you and they disown you. Did they love you to begin with? Probably not. If it costs you their friendship. The cost of losing one's life and soul of hell is a cost no man can put a dollar amount upon. This life we live is precious and valuable, but it will wear out. Mine's wearing out. I know in the last couple of weeks, they've been trying to fix things and some things aren't so fixable. But it's okay. I accept it. The body's wearing out from the outside, but the spirit is getting strong. That's what we're called to do. Amen. Okay. The huge difference between someone that lives for the world and one for the Lord. The worldly man fails to see what the result will bring because they only live for the moment. The saved man loves the Lord, has joy in knowing it. Fears not the end because it's a new beginning. And it will be something that is beyond our thought process because it's going to be so wonderful today can you say you have assurance of heaven i love asking this question to people because it shows you right where they stand many will say and i'm telling you from my heart i think so i hope so and maybe 
We can then seek and ask, how do you know you're getting the assurance of eternal life with Jesus Christ and in heaven? I'm going to give you some answers. I'm a good man. I'm a churchgoer. And I know of God. Not to be blunt. I have to be blunt. In a lovingly bluntness. If I'm blunt and it pulls someone and it makes them realize that their life right now is on the path of hell. And it gives them the knowledge and the Holy Spirit convicts them that it plucks them from hell. You know what? It's all worth it. Thank you. There are no maybes in heaven. Nor is there hope so's. Or think so's. There's no good men or women in heaven. I tell you that all the time. Or churchgoers that relied on, relied on it going to church instead of Christ. Many will claim they knew God, but many will hear these heartbreaking words. And they are. And I want you to, if you have your Bible, look, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 reads. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we not have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Do you know how many people that think they got it going on with God will hear those words one day? Do you know the horror? It will be too late to say, don't be afraid, just believe, because it's too late. Dear beloved church, dear beloved friends, that's you all. Anyone that I come in contact with, I love, because I'm called to love all, just as Christ loved all. Many a churchgoer have a false idea that going to church and knowing God grants them the privilege of being with Christ forever. I'm not preaching against a churchgoer. Trust me, I'm not. But a lot of people, they'll go to a church that they have no idea why they're there. They go to a church that never opens a Bible. They go to a church that never preaches the true gospel. And that breaks my heart. And they think that because of that or what they gave to their church, that will give them a reservation in heaven. But we know the only reservation you get in heaven is by confessing and believing upon Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm not preaching hate to the churchgoer. I'm preaching the truth. Many, many will think that they have heaven in their hand and not until they stand in judgment and will realize that when the book is open, the Lamb's Book of Life, they'll be waiting to hear their name called because they'll, they won't be at the Bema seat. They'll be at the great white throne of judgment and they'll be waiting for their name to be mercifully called and they'll be waiting and they'll be waiting and their name will never be called. You know the horror that breaks that brings to a person? You know the horror that that will give? That's why we're called to share with those we love. That's why we're called to, to share with people that don't know the Lord or are on the wrong path, whatever it may be, a false religion or something else. Okay. Be not afraid, only believe. Once this life, once this life is over, there are no redos. There are no second chances. There's no in between. I got to make that abundantly clear for some people. There is no in between. It's not like a waiting game and someone's going to get you to heaven. It's, it's false teaching. It's wrong. It's leading people to hell. It's not leading them to Jesus Christ. Today, be not afraid of what is in the news or what will happen. Be not afraid when you get through dip, when you have to get through difficult times. Be not afraid that you may look at the last day of your life starting today. Be not afraid of anything in the world places in your path to detour, to take you, to be an obstacle in your walk with Christ. Today, the Lord wants you to stand on the promises of what he is and what he can be in our lives. That anyone that trusts and calls upon him. Be not afraid because you believe in Jesus Christ and you have conquered death. He has conquered death. We he has beaten down and, and took the grips of hell from the, the man or woman's life that trusted upon him. We have conquered anything that Satan will throw at you. And trust me, 
the closer you get in your walk, it's not the less you're going to see of Satan, it's the more. Be not afraid because you have staked your life upon him. You have trusted him with your heart, your thoughts, and your life now and forevermore. So I ask you, are you afraid or do you believe? I pray you believe. Let's close in prayer. Dear love of Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you what the, the word shows us. We thank you what you have put in men and women in the Bible to show us where we are and where we are now with our faith. We had a woman that for 12 years had a continuous flow of blood and she was at desperation. And what does she, have, what does she do? She has faith to believe in Jesus Christ as her savior. She has faith to believe that he is the only one who can heal. No one else can. And she takes that, takes that step of faith and trust upon him. And she is well. That goes for Jairus who, who stepped out of something that was so difficult because he knew it would cause him ridicule. He knew it probably would cost him his seat in the synagogue. But what does he do? He takes a step out of faith to save his daughter. And he takes out a step of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the only one that can heal his daughter. And I pray that we here today, anyone watching, that we have taken this bold step of faith to understand the significance of whom Christ is. Only he can give us what we need. Only he can fill that void that many try to fill with sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be, material wants. It's a void that will never be filled until they fill that void with oh, Jesus Christ. I pray for someone today, Lord, that they would just come to you and trust you, Lord, and that the angels would be shouting, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your most precious grace and your love and all you've given us. In your precious name of Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.